He wants his children to be like him. So as he is holy, he wants us to be holy. As he is pure, he wants us to be pure. And that's what's being noted in 1 Peter 4, or excuse me, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. But you might also note 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6. And what these passages show is the activity uh, that will be found with the Christian, the Christian who is following after Jesus, the, the Christian who is following after God in that sense. And in 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6, it says, The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So if you're using Jesus as your example, as God in the flesh, we're to walk as he walked. And so there's an activity, not just enough to say, well, I love without the activity because the activity is what proves that you actually do love. We tend to think of love as too much within this society as an emotion. But there's no nothing actively attached to it. But uh, actually, the love is an activity. And then you might also note this passage. Well, we'll just, we'll just stop right there in 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6. But we want to be like God. That's, by the way, when we go back, to, back over to Matthew 5, verse 48, uh, as Jesus is noting a striving that we're to strive after, he says, therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so there is that activity of God that is to be seen in the activity of his children. So that uh, deals with those who are blessed. That means having God with us. And uh, so we need to demonstrate his disposition. And we'll say more about that as we continue on with this section. But what we want to take a look at is the word pure, catharsis. And uh, it is actually the result of verse 4. And this is Matthew 5, verse 4. And uh, this was our second step up God's mountain. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Remember that we talked about mourning as grieving over sin. And uh, if we're going to be effective in this life, we have to be those who grieve over our own sin because we're not going to make any changes if we don't. And so for those who grieve over their own sin, they strive to remove the sin from their lives and to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that brings about the purity that we're looking for. Are you able to hear me there? You have some problems? Yeah, there's, there's a little box in there over your thing. I was getting rid of it. It's a piece of Okay. I hope that worked out. Okay. So the blessed are those who mourn, or blessed are those who who grieve. Uh, they're really going to want to make a change, and the change is the result that is found within this beatitude, because they are the ones who will be seen as being pure in heart. That's what we need to we need to strive after. The word catharsis that is used right here uh, has an English word, catharsis. And uh, if you're trying to find out, we generally don't use that word very often, catharsis. But uh, I came across a, a quote uh, some time ago, and it says, Acting is a good catharsis. Now, the idea is that the audience sort of... Uh, uh, purges their emotions through the play. As the play is going on, then they get involved with it, and that brings about a change. And so this is the idea of the cleansing. There's a change, the cleansing, becoming pure. But if we go down to uh, Acts 15 and verse 9, we might note uh, this pure, this clean, this cleansing. 
as we we'll just look at a number of scriptures that uh, go along with this concerning uh, sorrow for our own sin and and uh, the result and uh, purification. In Acts 15 and verse 9, it says, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith, in reference to the Gentiles. And so as they became children of God, there was a cleansing of their hearts. And uh, that's the, uh, the use of this word. And also you might note in Hebrews 9 and verse 14, goes along with this particular thought and really notes the the element that brings about the cleansing and we're pretty I imagine that we all understand that of course it's the blood of Jesus Christ and our coming in contact with the blood of Christ and in Hebrews 9 verse 14 says how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God and then referring back to the blood says, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so there is a great purification process that takes place there as a result of the blood of Christ. Chris? In my verse, well, I've got the New International Version here, it says, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death. Okay. I know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I think this is kind of really direct here. The acts that lead to death would be the, the sin, the yeah. sinfulness, yeah. Yeah, in one's life. Okay. We might also note as we're as we're looking at all that, uh, a passage in first John one verse seven that you're probably all very familiar with. And that of course in reference to the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, the cleansing process will hopefully leave us with a purity of heart. I suppose someone could be a hypocrite with all of that, and in their hypocrisy, uh, not, uh, not do what they need to do. That doesn't seem likely. We're going to see uh, more about that. But uh, we come down to the word heart. And it's not the physical blood pump that we're looking at when the word heart is used. It's the, it's the Greek word cardia. And uh, we derive the English word cardiac. And we talk about a cardiac department within a medical facility. We talk about uh, someone undergoing cardiac arrest. And so most, uh, most people know through the use of the English word, what cardiac is all about. Well, this is the this is the cardia, and uh, it is not the physical blood pump, but rather it is the seat of emotions. Now, the Greek word cardia came to stand for man's entire mental and moral activity, both the rational and the emotional elements. And this is W. E. Vine's expository dictionary, and he says, in other words, the heart is used figuratively for the hidden springs of the personal life. And so it deals with the very inner mental and moral activity of an individual. And so the heart deals with someone's being something. Someone's being something. And uh, if you go on to note uh, James 3, verses 11 and 12. James 3, verses 11 and 12. This gets back to the thought that if there's a cleansing that takes place, then generally that which springs forth from that which is clean will be clean. So uh, even though I recognize we recognize hypocrisy, and hypocrisy can be found within uh, within the Christian life. Generally, what we're looking at in James three verses uh, James three verses eleven and twelve is the fact that that which is the source, if the source is pure, then that which flows from it is pure. And we understand that if the 
resultant water that comes forth from a spring is not pure, then obviously the source of that is not pure. And so in James 3, verses 11 and 12, it says, Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. And so this heart needs to be pure in order that the activity... Uh, there, there are people out there who will have an impure heart, and then for certain selfish reasons will do things that look to be pure and look to be good. But what the Lord is looking for is for the pure heart and for those who will respond with a pure heart. You might also note Mark 7. Now, I uh, had uh, verses 7 through 23, but let's take a look at Mark 7, verses 14 through 23, instead of going through 7 through 23. And we'll pick up the thought right there that I want to, uh, to note this evening. Mark 7 verses 14 through 23. And this is Jesus uh, indicating some of the same thought that is noted by James in James 3, verses 11 and 12. It says, And after he called the multitude to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which is going into him, that which going into him can defile him. Now, He's not, he's, we understand that he's not talking about somebody drinking a glass of arsenic. Uh, he's talking uh, from the spiritual side. He's not talking about the physical side. Uh, and so he's talking about the defilement of one's spiritual nature. So there's nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And when leaving the multitude, he entered the house. His disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside? And, of course, talking about food <coughs> and noting uh, the non-necessity for a distinction to be made between unclean food and clean food within the Christian age, certainly. Going into the man from the outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart. So this is what true defilement is all about. True defilement deals with the heart. The heart needs to be pure because it's only from a pure heart that those things that are accurately described by God as pure and clean and holy and right, only from a pure heart can they can they come forth. And so he says... Uh, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. Now we get back to what would be expressed from an impure heart. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, Envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. So the, the important point is, is not any defilement that might come as a, a result of something you might eat. That's not the important point. The important point is you've got to be producing those things that come forth from the heart, and they need to be the result of a pure heart. And so what we're dealing with is that we're, we're looking at the necessity to have a pure heart. Pure heart, of course, is that which is brought about as a result of the purity that's found through the cleansing process that's seen in the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we move on, you might note that pure in heart are those whose motives are absolutely unmixed, whose minds are utterly sincere, who are completely and totally single-minded. And again, that goes back to W.E. Vines. Uh, no, that goes back to Barclays. Really, I don't have it noted, but Barclays, New Testament words. So being pure in heart. So this step up God's mountain says, blessed are the pure in heart. So we need to strive to be pure in heart. Now the word pure 
it's used in passages like 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. Here's that quote I've got on the screen. Those whose motives are absolutely unmixed, whose minds are utterly sincere, who are completely and totally single-minded. That's by Barclay. But in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, as we look further into this idea of pure, and sometimes the word is translated clean, and I'm going to use a passage in Revelation 19 verse 8 in just a moment, where in the New American Standard Version at least, it's, the word is translated clean, but I'm going to show you the connection uh, between the church and the righteous acts of the saints in that particular passage. But look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. He says, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Uh, to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace it mean, means it's something that you need to take upon yourself with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So this idea of righteousness, faith, love, and peace is the activity of a pure <coughs> heart. And uh, for those who have those youthful lusts, they need to flee from them and go after those who already have a pure heart or be like those who already have a pure heart and pursue this righteousness, faith, love, and peace. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, still with this idea of pure, 1 Peter 1 and verse 22 It says, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another, one another from the heart. Well, that's because a purification process has taken place. And the result of that is a pure heart. And so we are <coughs> to love one another from the heart, because that heart is supposed to be a pure heart. Sometimes we let that slip by and sometimes we uh, allow the world to grab a hold of us and, and uh, we don't listen to our heart in that particular sense. But, uh, and sadly we do some things that are, not, uh, that are not right and would not seem to be from a pure heart. But that's what we're to strive to do. And then I want you to look at Revelation 19 verse 8 and Revelation 19 uh, verse 8 is talking about the, the bride of Christ. And she's making herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, she's wearing a beautiful bridal garb. And the bridal garb is made clean by the righteous acts of the saints. It has a very great application for us today. That the righteousness that is seen within the church is the result of the righteousness of the saints that make up the church. So in Revelation 19, verse 8, it says, It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. That word clean that is used right there is this word pure that we're looking at in these other passages. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And so you can understand why you don't want any stain or spot uh, on the garb of the bride because the bride is seen by the world and the world needs to see the beauty of the church and the beauty of the church can be ruined by the unrighteous acts of the saints within the body. And that's why we many times need to consider uh, in a very strong fashion discipline within the body when we're talking about a little leaven leavens the whole lump and a need for discipline within the body and a, and a need to, to uh, remove that which would uh, cause the, the garb to become filthy we as the church want to be seen as the beautiful bride not the spoiled bride not the bride that's been rolling around in the dirt not the bride that's been out there in the big pen we want the bride to be seen out in this world. This is very important. And sometimes I think uh, the appearance 
it's not so important to to those of us in Western civilization as it is to those of the civilization of the time in which this is written, more of the Oriental mind where appearance means a lot. And we really do need to, to stand up for the bride of Christ and we need to make sure that she remains pure and clean and holy. <coughs> Anyone have any thoughts up to up to this particular up to this particular point? Well, I think even today we live in a <clears throat> in a world that can be bought into the idea that there's an external purity. You know, we see religious leaders that wear the fancy um, robes and garments that. Um, might actually do us into thinking that these are are holy men. Jesus is trying to get us to see that we're way beyond the ceremonial yeah. uh, purity, but we're talking about deep down, genuine uh, you know, kind of purity that even if no man ever sees it, uh, I mean, it's a, you're you're really sincere in your faith. It's not just a ritual. Yeah. Exactly what uh, what God uh, wants uh, wants to be wants uh, seen what is actively uh, out there. You can see how this would fly in the face of what those Jews in the first century were witnessing, because the Jew, or the Pharisees, lengthened their tassels and they loved their robes and they had the phylacteries and um, they they were very showy. And all of those items from the, the tassels to the phylacteries uh, were just outward things that were supposed to indicate purity. Yeah. But Jesus says about as pure as a, a tomb. Yeah, yeah. Looks good on the outside. Full of dead man's bones on the inside. Well, let's go on to, uh, and note the the next part of this particular beatitude, for they shall see God. And uh, let's note uh, that God is not uh, a shape or form. We're not dealing with God as a shape or form, because when we're looking at shape or form, we're looking at uh, that which is found within the, the material world. Now, it is true that God is able to, on occasion, and we see this on a number of occasions within Scripture, where he will present himself in a physical form. You remember the story of Abram by the oak of Mamre, and he is uh, sitting there in the shade of uh, the oak uh, tree, uh, trees, a grove of trees that belong to an individual by the name of Mamre, and three individuals approach him on the road. All of a sudden, there's just three individuals there, Two of them are angels, and one is deity himself. And the three have manifested themselves, or at least deity has manifested the angels and manifested himself. And uh, they come, and that's the uh, time when Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be checked out. You remember the taking of Lot, his wife, and his two daughters by the angels. And then the conversation that uh, Abram has with God concerning if there be 50 righteous men, will you then what will you then destroy? And it gets down to uh, 10 righteous individuals, and probably that would be an equivalent number of uh, if you take a look, a close look at Lot and his family, and the number of other daughters and sons-in-law and sons. Uh, that probably and probably in the mind of Abram. At least within that family, there's got to be at least ten righteous, and that would save the city. But there's not even ten righteous within the family. In fact, you remember the angels have to take each member that they take out of the city uh, by hand and drag them. So God is not uh, a shape or form. Uh, he is not, uh, uh, in this sense, uh, visible to the eyes. He is not uh, anthropomorphic. And, uh, well, he is anthropomorphic in that there is ascribed to him sometimes the characteristics of human beings, but that's just for communication. We might understand uh, the eyes of God. God hears.
years, you see, the, the hand of God is not so short that I cannot say, well, all of that terminology is just terminology is done in a very human way. That's anthropomorphic in order that we might be able to better understand it. But that does not mean he is found in a, basically found within a physical form because he's not. He's spiritual. Now, what we need to note is uh, the passage is found in Exodus 20 and verse 4. And uh, that is uh, uh, the command that is given concerning making a likeness of God. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. And so the, there is not to be made any likeness of anything that would be worshipped, and that, of course, would be a likeness of God. We find within the Old Testament the making of a golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, and then we find two golden calves made, one placed at Dan and one placed at Bethel, when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, rebels and takes the ten tribes into the northern kingdom of Israel. But that's condemned uh, in Scripture. And what it is is that the spiritual must not be reduced to the material. How in the world could you ever make a physical figure that would adequately represent an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God in heaven? You can't, because if you make it look like a calf, if you make him look like a calf, then he can only, because of that calf, do what a calf can do. So you cannot take the spiritual and reduce it to the material. Because it certainly does not do God any justice. And besides, he's commanded, don't do it. So it can't be done. But man has a yearning to have God near him. In Acts 17 and verse 27 it says, and this is on... Uh, in Athens, uh, at the Areopagus. And you remember that Paul, uh, when he preaches to Greeks, when he preaches to Gentiles, the basis of the message is much different than the basis, of the, the basic message that he uses for the Jews. When he preaches to Jews, it's very much in the history line. Uh, when he goes to the Gentiles, he goes right to their basic needs, and, and in this particular case, goes after idolatry itself. He says in Acts 17 and verse 27 that they should seek God, perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So God is near, even though he is not visible, he is near. And when you go to, uh, and I don't have it down there, but when you go to Acts 17 verse 24, it says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. There is no need for God to have a temple. The only structure that God ever commanded was the tabernacle in the wilderness for Israel. He did not uh, come up with the idea for a temple to be built in Jerusalem. That was David's idea. And David then is not allowed to build it that it built the time of Solomon, but that was not God's idea. That was David's idea. And so he does not dwell uh, in temples made with hands because he is spirit. If you look at John 4 and verse 24, John 4 and verse 24, it says the God who made the world, excuse me, God is spirit. This is Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Uh, in Samaria, that God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him, worship in spirit and truth. So he is spirit. He is not physical. And uh, in Ephesians 4, verse 6, when it's talking about God, it says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But how are we to <coughs> see God? It seems to be a promise right here. Go back to Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, Jesus is going to explain it to us. We're, first of all, get, going to get some of the explanation 
right here from John 1, verse 1 and verse 14. And uh, remember that passage is dealing with uh, God in the flesh. starts out by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see that Jesus is God. Now, many times we're going to see a connection uh, in the Greek. And uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the thought comes up in the Hebrew also of uh, the closeness between knowing and seeing. And we use it in the English language all the time. We'll say something like, uh, well, let me explain that to you. And you explain it to them in words, and then the individual says, I see that. Well, did they literally see the words that were pouring out of my mouth? What did they mean by, I see that? Understood. Yeah, I understand that. I've come to know that. And so knowing and seeing many times uh, are used in that way. But I want to note something that might be of interest, and I don't know if it has any validity or not. But in Matthew 5 and verse 8, as you're looking at it, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, there is the definite article in the Greek that is placed before God right there, and it is literally, for they themselves shall see the God. And uh, it's a po there's a possibility that in the use of the definite article before the word God, that it doesn't necessarily refer to the abstract totality of deity, but context permitting uh, to one of the definite personalities of God. And so you might see the God as being the Father, you might see the God as being the Son, or you might see the God as being the Holy Spirit. If, if, you, if you go on and uh, note John 1, verse 18, John 1, verse 18, and here's God without the definite article, and uh, this reference would seem to be in reference to God in his general makeup. And uh, in his general makeup, uh, the general makeup of God cannot be seen. And, and if you look at John 1, verse 18, it says, No man has seen God. Definite article is not there. At any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So God cannot be seen in his infinity, in his deity, in his total being. But God can be seen especially as we see Jesus. As we see Jesus. Now we're going to note a pass passage here in just a moment that you're, going, that you're very aware of. And that's John 14. In fact, if you turn to John 14, verses 6 through 9, perhaps this will help us with this. Because uh, at this particular point, <coughs> Philip at, will ask Jesus a question about showing us the Father. <coughs> In John 14, verses 6 through 9, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And then Jesus makes a statement, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. See the connection we have between knowing and seeing right there. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me, or he who has seen the Father, he who has seen the Father, how do you say, show us the Father? And he Jesus is going to note that if you see him, then you see the Father. So what Jesus does in this ministry of his is what God, the Father, would have done had the Father come in the flesh. 
Or if the Holy Spirit had come in the flesh, it's going to be the same. So if you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. Now, we cannot see God in a, in a very general makeup way, but we can see God in the definite personality way. And we see Jesus, or we see, uh, when we see Jesus and we get to know Jesus, then we see God in the flesh. And so that's how we can see God. Now, let me note some other passages for you. Turn over to 1 Timothy 6 and verse 16. And uh, when we're looking at... Uh, do I have a question? Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead, George. So Jesus is not speaking of anything except the character of God here. When you see me, you know what God's like. Yeah. Personality-wise and so forth. That, that's it. That's what you're yeah. looking at we can't, we can't comprehend that side of God that is not definite personality. Or we can see, you know, from Scripture that there is an invisibility. But we don't necessarily comprehend fully the invisibility of something, you see. But we can see his definite personality. And what you see Jesus doing is what the Father will do. Sort of where this is going be, unless your heart is pure, and minus all the things that were in that one passage that we need to get rid of, you really can't understand what God's all about. There, in the first that's place. that's what we're that's what He's looking at. If you See? really want to get to know God, if you really want to get to know Jesus, and that's the way you get to know God by getting to know Jesus, you've got to be pure in heart. Yeah, I am. I was always thinking to see God would be more like when, when you die and you're in heaven, mm -hmm. you'll see Him. You know, I guess and that's heaven. true. Okay. Uh, we have a face-to-face. -face, we have a face-to-face -face, uh, passage uh, within the Revelation when we, when we get down in that final scene of the Revelation where we do see Him face to face. Then we see uh, His general makeup and His definite personality. But now it's just the definite so personality. So these are not. We are really not talking the same thing here. We're talking the seeing in the heart sense right there, now. There but, and of course, that, that leads is to... the knowing, the knowing sense. That's what we're looking at. Look, at, look Take a look at uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 16. Here is a way which, in which we cannot see, and this, this would go back to uh, no definite article used, just general makeup, not seen by any human being, First Timothy 6 and verse 16 says, Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Now we get a little bit of an idea of that which cannot be seen. I mean, it's indicated by unapproachable light. What does unapproachable light do to the physical eye? Well, unapproachable light blinds the physical eye. So one cannot approach God in that sense in the sense of a general makeup because he dwells in unapproachable light. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Look at 1 Timothy 1, verse 17. Here's some more of this same idea of general makeup. It says, Now to the king eternal. We don't, we don't see anything eternal. We have trouble even describing the eternal. Immortal. We understand there's immortality, but we don't really see it. We don't really know all that much about it. Invisible. Well, invisible means you can't see it. The only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The one that really keys this in is Exodus 33 and verse 20. And, and that's an indication of Moses and God having a discussion about Moses wanting to see the very face of God, the very kabod, which is the very glory of God. And God says, I'll cover you up in this rock and pass by. You can see my back. You can see the evidence of my passing. That's definite personality. But you cannot see my face. You cannot see my glory. Because no man can see my face and live. 
And so in Exodus 33, verse 20, he says, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So the seeing that we're looking at is the seeing of, of, uh, uh, of God in the way of definite personality. And Jesus reveals him to us. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father, is what he's talking about. And so we need to be those who seek after a purity of heart in order that we might be able to see God in the here and now. And, of course, the hope of that which lies beyond the here and now in that uh, heavenly scene. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.